A hive containing 60,000 bees fertilizes 35 million flowers per day. Bernard Vassier and his team at the INRA in Avignon are the first to have measured the economic value of bee pollination compared with the action of the wind and insects. It's important to measure the potential consequences of this decline of pollinators. And to measure that, we've developed a technique in the context of the alarm program which consists of evaluating the impact of insects as compared to wind pollination or passive self-pollination. Here we have a capitula with a hydrophilic plastic bag to measure pollination without wind or insects, passive self-pollination. Here we have a capitula and a gauze sachet that allows 75% of the atmospheric pollen to penetrate. The difference between the two gives us the impact of of wind pollination, and then pollination by insects, or free pollination. The difference between it and the two other capitulas will give us the impact of pollination by insects. The INRA has estimated that 80% of the world's plants would disappear without pollinators. For the agricultural sector, this represents a worldwide turnover of $153 billion. The bee is thus an ally to the world economy, a necessary condition for the harvest. Bees travel no further than three kilometers from their hives, and beekeepers move them in relation to the different flowering periods. This represents a veritable transhumance over hundreds of kilometers to collect pollen and nectar from hectares of apple trees, strawberry plants, and melon vines. In the past, beekeepers would pay to leave their hives near a field of lavender. Today, as the pollinators disappear, the farmers are calling the bees for help. Bruno Camus, professional apiarist, also runs his hives out to orchardists. It's true that pollination requires wide distribution of hives. You have to put four hives in one place, six in another. So we spread out our apiaries, which is not ideal for monitoring. And then you have to realize that you're always a little worried putting your hives in orchards, because you're at the mercy of a potential treatment and therefore of death. Nine times out of ten, it hasn't come from the orchardist who asked for the hives because he's perfectly aware and informed about the importance of bees. This is brownberry honey. I really do have great faith in the fact that beekeepers and farmers work together. It's undeniable the role of bees in pollination. It's also undeniable that we beekeepers need, first of all, sites to place our hives. Nine times out of ten, it's the goodwill of a farmer who lends us a place, and then also partly because our bees work on the cultivated plants, and partly because they also work on non-cultivated plants. So we've seen that without bees, there's no fertilization of flowers and hence no fruit or vegetables. But pollination presents another advantage of prime importance. The transport of pollen from one flower to another contributes to genetic dispersion, a melting pot of plant genes. This is how, since the beginning of time, fruit and vegetable varieties have been able to evolve and remain strong and resistant to disease. This floral diversity is also essential for bees. At this stage of our inquiry, it seems that the health of bees depends on a varied, pesticide-free diet. Following the different German, Swiss, and French testimonies, we went to the United States to meet the people who've named this mysterious bee affliction Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD. <laughs> T. 
David Hackenberg runs a professional pollination service. He has 2,000 hives that travel more than 5,000 kilometers a year. Most of our beehives right now are in upstate New York producing a crop of honey. They, they just came back from pollinating blueberries in Maine. And uh, we have a few beehives here today we're going to look at. Here, the decline of wild pollinators is dramatic. And fruit and vegetable producers cannot expect good harvests without renting hives from beekeepers. If the mortality of domesticated bees continues, by 2012, there will not be enough pollinators in the United States. If they all look like this, we'd be really happy. There are 50,000 bees in this hive. Good time of the year, you know, bees are doing fine and makes beekeepers happy. Although all the bees in the United States don't look like this right now. They're having problems. We already see some hives that are starting to come down with a problem. And uh, we'll walk over here and show you some, show you what, what CCD looks like. David Hackenberg is the first beekeeper in America to have alerted public authorities and scientists about the fatal decline of his colonies. This hive here has got problems. It's breaking down with CCD. As you see, there's no populations here. The population never builds up. The bees disappear before they get to age. And they're not gathering any feed. I mean, they're not bringing any honey. Uh, they got a problem. I mean, that hive in another couple Weeks may be dead, maybe, maybe going. You ask yourself, what did you do wrong? But finally, I realized it's not what I did wrong, it's where I've been and where my, the environment of my bees have been in. And when you stop and really start thinking about it from that aspect, that it's not what you did, but it's something out here that you have no control over, then you kind of get angry because of the fact that Somebody else is affect somebody else out here. Something else is affecting my livelihood, and there's nothing I can do to change it. David Hackenberg and researcher Dennis Van Engelstorp know each other very well. The beekeeper has entrusted his CCD-affected hives to the scientists who's been studying them for over a year. Uh-oh. And this bee right here, it's doing a dance. See? That dance is telling the other bees where to go and find some food. So there's not much in this colony at all. It's like it's weak and old bees who collect food have all disappeared and uh, they're not collecting food, so the, these bees are hungry. Research teams at the U.S. Ministry of Agriculture initially found an explanation, a virus. We have found, in a lot of cases, CCD colonies have Israeli acute paralysis virus. This virus that is not from Israel, it was just a guy in Israel who found it first. And so we think that what happens is that bees get the flu. Influenza. This virus was triumphantly announced in 2007 as being the cause of deaths in American bees, a single and ideal culprit that under the authority of the microscope annulled the other hypotheses, a virus. All that was necessary then was to find a cure. But Dr. Jeff Pettis revealed to us what they discovered when they pursued their investigations. Yes, we've been looking at viruses as probably just a, perhaps just a consequence of something else that's gone on in the colony. We know that honeybee viruses are always present, and under normal conditions, they don't cause a problem. With the virus theory discarded, the researchers turned their interest towards a fungus, Nosema, known to infect the bee. Nosema, which is a gut parasite of bees, is also on the rise in, U in U.S. colonies, and we don't understand why. Might the proliferation of Nosema be responsible for the abnormal mortality of bees in the USA? Nosema is an interesting one because there is this new type of Nosema now, Nosema serrana. And we are finding, in fact, in some of these colonies, very high levels of Nosema serrana in the summer, which is unheard of. Usually we see Nosema in the fall. 
So this is a problem for many beekeepers, Nosema serrana. There is no question. But in CCD colonies, most of the colonies that have CCD, we cannot find any Nosema serrana when we look. Neither the virus nor the Nosema theories can fully explain the sudden deaths of bee colonies. The American researchers are now looking at the impact of pesticides as well. We also wanted to look at pesticides, both the pesticides that the beekeepers applied to control the mites and the pesticides that maybe the bees were bringing in from the farm um, that farmers apply and bring it to the hive. We did find that there were high levels of pesticides in some cases, and certainly that can't be good for the bees, so it probably doesn't help. It's probably a problem in bees' health. In the middle of apples, they sprayed a sail, which is a nicotinoid emitted corporate product. They were told by the chemical companies, you can spray this stuff in the middle of apples because it's safe for honeybees. It don't kill adults. Well, I agree with them. It don't kill adults, but it's, it's the sublethal dosage of this stuff that they bring back to the hive, feed to the young, and it becomes a birth defect. In the U.S., we almost never look at interactions. At least we're not required to look at the interactions between two pesticides. So that's something that we're also beginning to try to understand, whether two pesticides together could be more harmful than either one of them alone. And also in com combination with things like fungicides, which are often applied at the same time that a pesticide would be applied. So we don't require that testing go on to look at the interactions, but it's something that we're looking into as, as possibly contributing. You visit the scientists here in the United States, they're going to tell you that we're finding 25 pesticides in the samples of pollen, 30-some fungicides, numerous herbicides, all in a little sample of pollen that big. Same conclusion as in France. The pesticide mixtures produce effects that no one can control. Most of the scientists here in the United States, off the record, you know, if they weren't talking to you on camera or talking to the news media, they're going to tell you that they're almost sure that the pesticide is the problem. We don't want to just put out false warnings. So we don't want to say that oh, we, we're worried about this compound or that compound without some really good evidence. Because then the grower or the beekeeper becomes confused. It, you've told me this was a problem, this was a problem, this was a problem. And now you're telling me it's not a problem. So we want to be sure that we have good evidence before we talk about reasons for concern. Coming from the researchers who in 2007 had proclaimed the existence of a link between the virus and the collapse of bee colonies, such caution about confirming the role of pesticides in the disappearance of bees is food for thought. Does the $33 billion market shared by a handful of agrochemical companies have anything to do with this caution? Hey, was not the virus theory the ideal for a new pharmaceutical contract? Looks like, these pumpkins, looks like these pumpkins are getting ready for bees. I see a couple flowers up here. I, I think if you can come Thursday, that are, that will be pretty good. Uh, if we can look at about 200 hives uh, by the end of the week, uh, that will get us started, and uh, uh, another 200 in about two weeks. We're going to go to New York here Monday and Tuesday and get them ready and get them down here. So we'll be in here probably Friday, Thursday night or Friday morning early. No, they just put a big bunch out. Right here, coming up. That's the one. That's all, yeah. I'll be darned, that's the first one I saw. Yep, yep. Yep, coming along. Uh, Thursday's going to be about perfect. We won't miss yep. anything. Yep. If I had to count on wild bees uh, for my pumpkin crop, I, I would not pay for the cost of planting and, and starting a crop. Pollination is so important. Uh, we need the extra bees in for, for hives, and the, the wild bees just aren't going to uh, be able to handle that. It may seem incredible, but wild bees are inexistent in the large crop growing areas of America. We've seen a dramatic increase in the cost of the bees uh, because the beekeepers have to replenish their beehives. So we've seen a, an increase uh, in price by twice as much as the previous year, and that was just, just in one year. I haven't changed a lot of my personal practices yet. Uh, if I can get some scientists to, to you know, pinpoint some of the chemicals that are causing the damage, I, I will make those changes here on this farm. But I said, you know, I, I got enough problems. I just don't have time to screw around with you guys. If I probably had my, my best wishes for the bees, I probably wouldn't meet, move bees to pumpkins. But the farmer's got to have bees. I have to have a paycheck to keep going. So sometimes we take bees in places where we know 
it's not good. So what we're doing is trying to help them get through it.